Uh, Kevin Williamson, National Review roving correspondent. Thank you for joining us here. We are here today at uh, Freedom Fest in Las Vegas. And um, even while we're here, you're still writing. And um, an interesting article that you brought out this morning was talking about um, your belief that political pundits that are comparing the current times that we're in right now to 1968 and with the political conventions coming up next week, you don't believe that we are where we were in 1968. Um, do you want to expand on that? Yeah, not even close. And uh, beyond 1968, uh, the other thing you've, you've heard a lot of in the last couple of years is that this is the most divided the country has been since the 1860s, the 1850s, and the Civil War. And in fact, I thought that was was remarkable enough that I went and Googled examples of how many people have said this over the years and at what periods of time. And as it turns out, if you look at the political discourse, we are always the most divided we've been since the Civil War. There are people saying this in the 1960s and the 1980s, during the Clinton administration, um, 10, 11 examples from the last couple of years, uh, Jerry Brown, Jimmy Carter, uh, Gawker, people on the right, people on the left, everyone believes this. I don't think it's true. I mean, I, I spent a lot of time traveling around the United States. It certainly doesn't feel like a country on the verge of civil war to me. Um, it seems like a pretty prosperous, peaceful, happy uh, sort of place with a kind of angry political discourse. Um, but I think that's more of a product of... Um, current media environment, which we live in, it has anything to do with organic politics. So if you think about it, when you, know, when you were a kid, when I was a kid, um, we had the Soviet Union. You know, we had the USSR that was our big rival on the world stage. They were promising, we will bury you, and they had a whole bunch of nuclear weapons to uh, at least try to back that up. Now we've got you know, the Islamic State, Al-Qaeda, sort of half-organized desert savages who aren't really going to amount to much in the long term. Everyone knows this. They can do horrible things, but in terms of, you know, conquering, occupying the United States and flying the uh, Islamic flag over the capital. It's just not going to happen. Um, we had, you know, 20% uh, interest rates in the 1970s and runaway inflation, uh, real economic problems. We just had a president driven out of office uh, through impeachment. Those were pretty, you know, pretty tense times. This is nothing like that. And it's certainly nothing like the, uh, the run up to the Civil War. So people in politics, which includes people who write about politics, um, are the most self-important people in the world. And you have to be kind of self-important to, to do that. I mean, it's, it takes a certain amount of healthy ego to go out there and say, here's this country of 315 million people, and I'm the guy who uh, can run it, or I'm the guy who can manage it, who needs to be in charge of it, or I'm the guy whose opinions are so important that you need to listen to on that. We're very, very self-important people. And part of that is believing that you, be that you live in the most important times, that the times that you live in are the times of the greatest consequence, the times of the greatest moment, and... Um, and that it's all very dramatic and all very important. So my, my piece today was arguing that maybe we should consider the possibility that it's not, that 100 years from now people will look back on this as a relatively quiet time uh, in the United States, that they'll remember Barack Obama not as the worst president or the best president, um, but just as sort of a, you know another president. Um, he was the first African-American president. They'll remember that about him, certainly. The way people remember Al Smith was the first Catholic nominee, but don't remember anything else about him. One of the commonalities of 1968 and why a lot of pundits are bringing it up today mm -hmm. is the internal strife that we see. Yeah. With today, we have BLM in 1968, yeah. we have the race riots uh, in Chicago and such. Um, is that separate from your argument today? It, the you well, refer no. to it as drama. Yeah, it okay. is. It is. So, I mean, those are, those are real things, and there are obviously real parallels. Right. Um, when you see race riots and snipers, I mean, it makes, you know, makes you think of Newark in the 1960s or Trenton and other places, they have problems like that. So, I mean, it's certainly not a time of, of complete quiet. Um, but even the riots that we've had over the last couple of years, the civil disturbances, have been relatively small compared to what they were in the past. Um, you don't have a society uh, full of people who are really even very much politically engaged, much less engaged in a really sort of, you know, confrontational, angry, uh, violent sort of politics. It's just not where we were in, in, in the 60s or in the, in the 19th century. Uh, one of the indicators I always like to point out on this is what people are actually paying attention to. As I mentioned in my piece today, um, Sean Hannity did a show a couple of uh, a couple of weeks ago, maybe a couple of months ago, we did a town hall with Donald Trump, and he got an unusually large audience for a cable news program in that spot, but it was something like one-fiftieth of the audience that tuned in to watch reruns of The Big Bang Theory that night. So... Um, <laughs> National Review, which is, is by a long shot the biggest magazine of our sort, our readership is about 4% of Us Weekly. Um, there are a lot more people who read Golf Digest than read the New York Times. 
So if you look at what people are actually paying attention to, where our minds actually are, uh, what's actually going on in our lives in reality, politics is not at the center of it. And it shouldn't be, of course. We don't want it to be at the center. A normal, healthy society um, is not one that's dominated by politics and political discourse. It's where people are raising their families and starting businesses and working and, and doing that sort of stuff that amounts to real life. And um, we, we have a very different media environment there. So we've got a lot of it. We've got um, social media, which kind of keeps people who are politically involved in a constant state of froth. And uh, it's not like when you have you know, telegraphs and print newspapers and things like that. And that's how news travel, things were a little maybe slower and calmer in some ways then, at least emotionally, than they are now. But people are really not particularly politically engaged at the moment. And um, some people think that's a bad thing. I actually kind of think it's a good thing. One of the things I've always liked about Switzerland is if you walk around Switzerland and walk around Zurich or Geneva, ask people who the president is, they don't know. Because it doesn't really matter. They don't know here either. <laughs> they know who the president is. People don't know who the vice president is. No. And, uh, because no one can believe it's Joe Biden, because that's insane. The, it's, it's, uh, the man on the street interviews today are getting scarier and scarier. Yeah. So continuing on, on your discussion on this, and you mentioned drama, and, and, and you made a, a, a relative comparison to the 1980s when you talked about how people were, were what they're concerned about today they were concerned about in the 80s where the Japanese are going to come yeah. and take over and take over our jobs and and how the, that kind of drama or that worry if you will has been uh, applied to this election certainly from the right with Trump um, it, it, do you believe that Trump is using that as, as a as a wedge as a as a tool for this yeah well it's funny and so we every generation of Americans in the modern era has the Asian economic Superman that they're afraid of, they think it's going to come eat our lunch. Um, it used to be it was Chinese immigrants back a long time ago. We were in California, you know about the Chinese Exclusion League and all right. that. There are so many of them, they're, they can work so cheap, they're going to swamp us. Of course, that didn't happen. In the 80s, uh, it was Japan. Uh, and Trump actually was a big anti-Japan guy in the 80s, making the same speeches then uh, that he makes now about China. The Japanese were going to dominate everything. They were going to, you know, put all of our car companies out of business, and all of our electronic companies. Of course, Japan, you know, that's not what happened. Um, they're actually a society that's very much in decline in a lot of ways. They've got serious economic problems. And the discussion about China um, is, is also several years out of date, I think. You know, we were worried that China was going to have worldwide global economic hegemony. Right now, they're just basically doing their best to stave off economic crisis at home. We're still talking about uh, the Chinese government's habit of artificially lowering the value of its currency, which they were doing for a long time. Right now they're trying to raise it because it's, uh, it's been so weak over the last several years that they can't afford to have it that low either. Um, you know, economic realities ultimately always reassert themselves. Um, you know, 10 years from now we'll probably be talking about the, the Indian economic superman who's going to come and take all of our jobs and, and do all that. As someone who used to live in India, I have a great affection for the place, but that's just not going to happen. Um, they are not on the verge of, of taking over the world and supplanting uh, the United States' place as the preeminent global economic power. Um, it's been a bad few years economically. I mean, growth has been pretty weak. Uh, income growth has been pretty weak. And uh, employment growth has not been, not been super strong. People are anxious about a lot of things. I think some of the problems with the entitlements are starting to really sink in for people that Social Security and Medicare in their current forms just aren't going to be there um, 15 years down the road, 20 years down the road. And people are anxious about, about that sort of thing. But, you know, we're still seeing economic growth. We're still seeing wages go up, not as fast as we would like. Um, we don't have bread lines. We don't have people starving in the streets. Um, you know, 19, what was it, 79, I guess, if you wanted to get a mortgage, your interest rate was going to be 19%, right. something like that. You don't pay that on a credit card now. I mean, Donald Trump might because he's got bad credit. But, um, well, if you have a late payment, you pay 28%. Uh, is that what it is? Frank Dodd. I, I wouldn't know anything about that. <laughs> That's the Frank Dodd Act for you. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's interesting because we're here at, at, at Freedom Fest, which is a libertarian-leaning, free markets, free mind capitalism. Right. Um, and, and so what you're talking about with the economy, a lot of people will say, well, there are bread lines, but they're through EBT cards. Mm. That, yeah. that you had, you've had a huge increase in, in uh, social welfare and, and that it's just now different. You don't have encampments outside in Central Park. Yeah. I mean, if you have the spending, people will soak it up in various ways. I mean, if you put money on the table, someone's going to pick it up. It always, it always works that way. Um, no, I think that is uh, an exaggerated concern. I mean, one of the things that you'll, you'll notice if you've been doing what I do for a long time is that if you have something to sell, 
whether it's books or a radio show or a television show or something like that. Armageddon sells really well. Right. You know, we're on the verge of Civil War sales really well. There's going to be a worldwide economic... There would be no libertarian movement if it weren't for guys who made their money saying there's going to be a worldwide economic meltdown tomorrow by gold. You know, because <laughs> that's where all the advertising comes from. Uh, well, there it's... Totally and sad. a third of the guys outside. Right, are. a third of the guys outside are doing that, you know. <laughs> Move to Belize, right. and uh, yep. well, I'm not, you know, not so sure about all that, because that stuff is exciting, and yeah. um, and it keeps people engaged. That's why talk radio, conservative talk radio, is really funny. It's it's the same show every day. It's you are being betrayed by evil elites in New York or Washington or wherever it is you don't live, and it doesn't matter what the news of the day is. It's the same story every day. Every one of these shows does the exact same thing, and uh, that stuff is really good. It's good theater. But it's not where the world actually is. And the problem is that um, crisis is exciting and prosperity and stability are boring. Um, you know, if you look at the Eisenhower years, uh, one of the best periods in American history. Um, Eisenhower wasn't maybe as much of a conservative as National Review would have liked for him to have been. But in retrospect, he looks, looks pretty good. And those look like pretty good years. And the 1960s, in a lot of ways, with all of their trouble and discord, were reactions to that. Now, there were legitimate things... To, going on there. Two people were unhappy about the war and people were unhappy about the situation of African Americans, which something needed to happen with. Um, there was action that needed to be taken there. But it was a time of, not just in our history, but in the world history of just unprecedented peace and prosperity. And people got bored with it very, very quickly. And uh, it produced what came after. All right. Now let's segue, if we can, to, to the election. If we must. If we must. Um, Obviously, uh, working for the National Review, which has publicly taken a stand against Trump, you've written a book against Trump, the case against Donald Trump. Uh, on Ricochet, it's the debate of, of the century right now between never Trumpers and, and, and anybody but Hillary, so let's accept Trump. For those people that are arguing, and, and let, let's get to this specific argument is, well, we gotta you know, protect the Supreme Court or whatever mm -hmm. the issue is to, to support Trump. Um, is there, how would you respond to those individuals that say that these guys have really painted themselves into the corner regarding Never Trump? Yeah, well, a couple of things. Um, I would say that if your argument is that you think Donald Trump would be a better president than Hillary Clinton, and on election day you want to go pull the lever for Donald Trump and say, that's my calculation, that's how I see it, well, fine, that's okay. Uh, it's not my position, but it's a perfectly defensible position. The problem with that, of course, is that that's just one day of the year. And we're American citizens. We have to be citizens 365 days a year. On the other 364 days a year, it's important, I think, to keep in mind uh, who and what Donald Trump is, which is he is someone who is morally and intellectually unfit for the office. He is the sort of person who should be kept as far away from the levers of political power as it's humanly possible to keep him. Now, if you say, okay, that's all true, but we still think Hillary would be worse, okay, well, that's, that's fine. Um, but you have a responsibility, I think, to tell the truth and to say what's actually going on in the country, uh, which is the fact that we have, um, as a country, as a political system, as a society, and as a culture, uh, just produced a, a massive, massive uh, failure in producing these two candidates as the best that we can do uh, as a country. I think that's been a, a bit of a tragedy for us, and I think that we should continue talking about it. Because regardless of how the election turns out, um, if Donald Trump should win, he's still going to be someone who's unfit for the office. If your argument is the Supreme Court, I think that's naive thinking that Donald Trump is necessarily going to uh, be someone who would produce better justices than Hillary Clinton would. I mean, he may, he may not. He's perfectly capable of naming anyone from Judge Judy to Kim Kardashian to the Supreme Court. Uh, he put out that document with his list of you know, 11 potential candidates on it. Uh, a while back, which was clearly him going to one of his advisors and saying, there are a bunch of conservatives out there who are worried about the court. Give me a list of people to make them happy. And uh, whether anyone from that list will ever actually be seriously considered, I have no idea. I mean, he's not a trustworthy person. He's certainly not an honest person. So the fact that he would put this out as anything other than marketing uh, to you know, rip off the same chumps that he's been doing for his entire career, um, you know, these credulous people who really want to believe in whatever it is they think he stands for, um, you know, is, is unsurprising to me. So it's, you know, it's a game of Russian roulette, right? I mean, the best you can say is it's a game of Russian roulette that we think Hillary is certain disaster and Donald Trump is probably disaster, but maybe not, that there's a chance, you know, that things might come out better. Um, 
I think there's a lot of wishful thinking embedded in that. And I think that a lot of people who are you know, very passionate about politics and very engaged in politics simply resist the notion that, well, there's no good answer this time around. And there just isn't one. Um, there's no good outcome from this election. Um, even Gary Johnson, who uh, a lot of people on my side have turned to in their uh, moment of crisis, I don't think he's really someone who would be a very good president. I mean, he's an okay guy. He was a good governor. He's here. Yeah, he's, he is here. Yeah. He is here. Yeah. I don't think he'd be a very good president for, for a number of reasons. I think he's a bad person. Right. Um, but there's just not a good choice out there. So in retrospect, as a journalist, as a pundit, is there anything you wish pundits, journalists, yourself may have done differently over the past year um, to thwart Trump's nomination? No, and I don't think we could have. Uh, again, you know, we talk about, I was talking about self-importance among pundits and such earlier. The truth is not many people listen to us. Um, people really don't, in the wider culture, listen to people like me, people like National Review. There was a poll a couple of years ago, and it was sort of heartening. It was um, it's a little bit dated because Keith Olbermann still had a show at the time, but they were asking people about various uh, of these figures. You know, what do you think about Rachel Maddow? What do you think about Rush Limbaugh? What do you think about Keith Olbermann, Sean Hannity, things like that? Bill O'Reilly, I think, was on the list. And the most common answer by far in every case, except I want to say for Rush Limbaugh, the most common answer was never heard of him. <laughs> people don't do this. So... Um, you know, National Review, uh, which is a pretty big magazine for a magazine of our kind, uh, we're probably the biggest one in the United States, as a political opinion magazine, has less than 5% of the readership of Us Weekly. A lot more people read Golf Digest than the New York Times. A lot more people read Cosmopolitan than The Economist. And uh, that's just where the culture is. So we could go out and make, you know, the best case in the world against someone like Donald Trump. And I'm not saying I made the best case in the world, but I think I made a pretty good one. Um, it's, it's not going to, to move the needle that much. We'd have a very different country if you know, we had as much influence as we like to pretend that we do. Um, that's just not how things work. Well, I know you've got a panel to get to. I um, do. I appreciate you taking the time. How do people find you online? Uh, NationalReview.com is the easiest way. And um, Twitter at KevinNR. And uh, sometimes I get surly late at night, so you can come Terrific. watch me uh, lose my temper. I've seen it. Thanks. Thanks, sir. Take care.